Have you ever wondered why people click on negative headlines more than positive headlines? We're living in a society where literally everything is fear-based driven when it comes to media. All the headlines you see are fear-based to make you click. Why is that? Well, it's because we as humans are drawn more towards negativity than we are positivity, which is the craziest thing. And have you ever wondered why? And it, it, it's, it's one of the greatest mysteries in the world, but we do it. So we're literally feeding the beast. The more we do it, the more they're going to put out things that aren't even true. They're not even true. These media outlets have been called out many, many, many times and proven to send out and write about false information. It, it, it's the craziest thing, the, the world that we live in. But this is where we live. When it comes to this NAR settlement and the ramifications of the NAR settlement, which, by the way, let me explain it really quickly, okay? The National Association of Realtors got sued along with a lot of other brokerages of colluding uh, to inflate commissions, got found guilty in, in, a, in a courtroom in Missouri. Uh, more copycat lawsuits were filed all over the country, and this has become a nationwide thing, and now... All the big brokerages are getting sued, and they're settling out left and right. We just saw Compass settle out. Um, Anywhere and Remax settled before the uh, the trial even started. Keller Williams uh, settled after the trial, um, and you've got a handful of uh, more than a handful of other brokerages that will be settling out soon. We'll start to see headlines everywhere about these brokerages settling out, and the, like. They got found guilty, and now everyone's settling because nobody can pay the billions of dollars, okay? Now, what does that mean for us as real estate agents, okay? Let me break it down. NAR and NAR settlement, okay, which has been proposed. I don't believe it's been submitted to the courts yet. It may have been at this point submitted to the courts, in which case it's it'll go through a process of getting fully approved. But in the settlement, they call for... Let's just, you know, talk about the elephant in the room, the buyer agent fee getting removed from MLS. Now, when you hear that, a lot of agents take this and run with it so many different directions. There's a, there's a lot of misinformation out there and uh, opinions, theories, hypotheses, all kinds of things, uh, rumors, you name it, it's happening and news outlets are even taking this running with it and writing the, the wildest headlines. Why? To get people to click. Now, what I want to get into is the fact that this is not the first time that this has happened. This is not the first time that something scary has come into the industry. Uh, I say scary, something that scares people. It's not even scary. It's something that scares agents, right? And sometimes consumers. But I'm talking to real estate agents, scares agents, half to death. And this isn't the first time. It won't be the last time. There's been so many things over the years that have, you know, came out through headlines and, and people's opinions and gossip and rumors to steal our jobs, to steal our jobs. But yet here we are still getting paid the same amount that we were when I started in real estate over two decades ago, I get the same commission rate as I did back in the day, five or six percent, five or six percent, five or six percent. And it's really the same in terms of how many I take at six, how many I take at five. It hasn't been affected whatsoever. We're in a time right now where more consumer consumers have more access to information. They know more about the property than you do, right? Why? Because they're studying that single property. We're studying, you know, the whole market. They've really went deep on this one specific neighborhood, this one specific property. They know more than we do, but yet we're at an all-time high with the amount of buyers and sellers who choose by choice to use real estate agents. Why is that? It's because the more information they have, the, the, the more confusing it is and the more an agent is needed to help them through the process. So many people have come out and said that, you know, 
all this information, uh, you know, Zillow and, and, you know, everything else is going to take your job. What do you need real estate agents for? Got all the information. The information is not what they need real estate agents for. And you know that you're a real estate agent. If you're watching this as a consumer, you'll find out soon enough when they remove the buyer agent commission from MLS and you think, oh, I don't need an agent. So you go do it on your own. You're going to find out real quick. And if you do one or two deals and it goes great, great. Good for you. Awesome. Like, just so you know, just to put you on notice, we don't care as real estate agents if you use us or not. Okay. Like it doesn't matter to us if you use us as, as real estate agents or not. I'm going to stay busy with people who do hire me to help them buy or sell a property. And I'll be as busy as can be. Why? Because of the three principles. Okay. These three principles, the foundations of real estate and how to build a real estate business will never change. I'm basically going to go through these three principles. They will, it will never change. It's been this way from the beginning of time. And regardless of what technology comes out, it doesn't matter. MLS came along, Zillow came along, social media came along, electronic signatures came along. What else did I write down? Amazon came along. Um, for sellbyhunter.com came along. iPhones came along. Uh, now we have AI that's come along. The NAR settlement, just technology in general. Sure. Does the how-tos change? Absolutely. It's changed dramatically, right? But the fundamentals and principles of the business have not changed, and they never will change. And these three mind-blowing business-building principles for real estate agents are what I discovered going from roofing houses with my father for less than $10 an hour to becoming a real estate agent, making over a million dollars a year as a single agent in Alabama. All right. So anything is possible. Let me just throw that out there, but let me dive in here. All right. Principle number one, your job as a real estate agent is to expand influence in the market and connect buyers and sellers. That will never change. I don't care what happens in, in terms of technology or what AI does, right? I've always said when Zillow came along, I, you know, people were saying Zillow is going to take your job. I said, no, it's not. Zillow is going to make my job 10 times easier. It's going to help me sell more property in less time. And guess what it did? It helped me sell more property in less time. AI, same thing. People are saying, oh, AI is going to take your job. If AI takes real estate agent's job, okay, it's going to take everyone in the world's job. And then everybody, I guess, will have a job, you know, remote controlling a, an AI robot. I don't know what we're going to do, right? <laughs> But the fact is, is that AI, okay, this is my opinion, is only going to make the world a better place for real estate agents. It's not going to do anything to harm us. It's going to enhance us. It's going to help you as an agent sell more property in less time. Now, when you think about expand influence in the market, okay, let me go back to it. Your job as a real estate agent is to expand influence in the market and connect buyers and sellers. So I, I always realized that my job was to connect buyers and sellers. That's common sense. That's everybody knows that. Right. And and honestly, in today's world, the way that it's set up right now with the buyer agent figured into the listing side commission and MLS and, and technology and everything else. We've kind of gotten lax on that part, and we and we we allow technology to actually do the connecting for us. We find the buyer, and then we uh, we we wait on another agent to find the seller and put it on MLS, or we find the seller and then we put it on MLS and wait on another agent to find the buyer. We don't really connect the buyer. We connect them, right? We do connect them, and we connect them in a very efficient way, right? Rather than having to actually go out and find the buyer for a listing or find the, the listing for a buyer, technology, again, has made it to where we can do way more and sell more property in less time. This is just one example of many, okay? However, we have gotten a little lax there, and it's okay. It's for the sake of volume. If we're able to stack listings, stack listings, and let every other agent sell the properties, awesome. I took advantage of it. That's how I sold 100 properties a year was taking advantage of that opportunity. 
And it's a great opportunity. And I believe it will continue to exist. Okay, guys, it is your time. If you want to up your game when it comes to getting more listings, I'm going to cover my entire handwritten letter strategy on today's coaching call at 5 p.m. Eastern. Now, I'm going to tell you everything from top to bottom. I'm going to tell you what to write, how to write it. But here's where you're going wrong. Right, you're doing the easy part, you're writing the letters, awesome, you're sending them out, you're posting it, great. But when the sellers call you, you're fumbling. You're fumbling the opportunity. You don't know exactly how to convert that into a listing. So that's exactly where I'm gonna come in and give you a lot of support and training on today's call. All you have to do is go to zero to diamond.com, create a profile if you're not already a member, go down to coaching calls in the menu section and there's the Zoom link right there. And if you miss the call, that's okay because all the replays of all the coaching calls are right there for you. I'll see you on the call. The expand influence part in the very beginning of my career, right? And if you don't mind, know my story, I basically got in when I was 20, made a meal by the time I'm 23 in real estate commission, started flipping houses with that, and then lost everything, lost every single dollar, went bankrupt, went foreclosed, was sleeping in my car, eating out of people's refrigerators, the whole nine yards, went back to roofing houses, worked on an oil rig for a year. And the reason being is this right here. And this is, this is why I, I emphasized expand influence because at the time I wasn't expanding my influence. And it's literally the reason why I lost everything that I own and which not only to the bottom, I went below the bottom. I was underneath the ground whenever all this happened because I didn't understand that part of my job was to expand influence and maintain influence in the market. I would call 10 property owners and say, who wants to make 100000 a day? Someone would take me up on it. I would throw it on MLS. It would sell in a day and close in 30 days. I would make 20, 30 grand. And that seller disappeared. They weren't trying to make a relationship with me. They, didn't, they weren't fixing a rebuy into this overinflated market at the time. And I wasn't trying to talk to them anymore. I was like, let me go make 10 more calls and I'll go make 10, 20, 30 more thousand dollars. Uh, I didn't need the seller. So I wasn't expanding my influence. I was only connecting buyers and sellers. I missed the entire expand influence part, which is building relationships in the market, maintaining those relationships and nurturing those relationships for the rest of your life. That's what expanding your influence is all about through whatever means works best for you. Some people do it through social media. Some people do cold calls and, and emails. Some people do direct mail. Some people do door knocking, networking, event, sphere of influence, Zillow leads, whatever it is, it doesn't really matter as long as you have a, a high enough volume of, of new leads, people coming into your ecosystem, you're connecting with them, you're creating the relationships and you're nurturing those relationships forever with a system on the back end whatever that is for you, whatever that means. But at the end of the day, our job is to expand influence in the market, connect to buyers and sellers. That's never going to change. The way we do it may change. The way we get paid may change. The disclosures we have our clients sign may change. But the fact that this is our job will remain that way forever. All right, let's get into the second one. Regardless of any headwinds in the market, or artificial fear driven by the possibilities of what might happen, people will forever buy and sell homes every single day by the myriads. Now, what is myriads? Myriads means countless. It means unlimited. It means an extremely high number, right? In classic history, it meant a unit of 10,000. And, and, and this is very important to realize this. When you realize this principle right here, when you realize this uh, uh, perspective right here, this will change everything for you because why? Weight starts to be lifted off of your shoulder and you, you stop worrying about A, the market headwinds. Anything that might happen in the market, you don't worry about it anymore because you realize closings are going to happen unlimited every single day, forever. So it's like, what, what do we got to worry about the market? So you stop worrying about that. When you, when you really realize this, you stop worrying about the market and you stop 
playing into the artificial fear driven by the possibilities of what might happen in terms of, you know, uh, NAR, you know, this NAR settlement's going to completely wipe buyer agents uh, out of the game. No, it's not. No, it is not. It's absolutely not. I mean, that, that's what they said about Zillow. That's what they said about for sellbyhunter.com. That's what they've said about AI for years and years and years. They're going to keep saying it. And the people that say it, right? You've got the news media that says it. And then you got the just regular common people that say it. They don't know what they're talking about. And they're saying it. And when you hear enough people say it, that's just in the general public, you know, you see the news people, media say it. Then you hear the general public say it. And then you start to believe it. And it's just this domino effect that just comes crumbling down on top of you and it creates so much fear and anxiety and it starts to affect the way that you operate in your day-to-day -day business in a very extremely negative way that's extremely harmful to your business. You've got to block this stuff out. You have to block it out. Guys, nothing has changed as of right now, when it comes to the NAR settlement and what is going to happen, we don't know what the ramifications are actually going to be of the NAR settlement. We don't know how it's going to affect the way the consumers actually decide how they're going to pay agents or if sellers are going to really stop offering buyer agent commissions because they can still offer it as a concession. We don't know. We have no earthly clue, but I'll tell you what I do know that it does not matter. What matters is that you're doing your job. Now, what is your job? Hmm? What is your job? Your job is to expand your influence in the marketplace as big as you possibly can. No holding back. No holding back. No matter what the market's doing, no matter what anybody says, no holding back. You've got to get that influence so big, which means the number of people in your database that know who you are, what you do, and you're here to help. You're to the moon. No, who cares about anything else? To the moon. Building your database, building your influence, having those one on one conversations. The only thing between you and a million dollars a year are thousands of one on one conversations with people in your market. That is it. That is it. Now, you could spread those conversations out over the course of 20 years, or you can have them all within three to five years and go ahead and knock this thing out and get to that million dollars. I promise you. If you listen to what I'm saying and you'll take action, you'll have a better life forever. Now, the headwinds in the marketplace or artificial fear driven by the possibilities of what might happen, right? People talk about, you know, um, you know, when when you know Amazon, when they partnered with Realgy at the time, it's now anywhere. People thought that that was literally going to be the end of real estate agents. All they did was offer a, a home, like a Alexa, basically, uh, like an Alexa or whatever, you know, with their closing. I mean, that's all they did. It literally affected nothing. You should be focused on expanding your influence to the moon and connecting buyers and sellers. That's not going to change. If, in fact, a rule comes into place, where we have to disclose things differently. Maybe we have to start getting paid by the buyers in some situations. Who cares? Why do you care about what might happen? 95% of the things that you worry about never happen. And the 5% that does, you can deal with it when it happens. So therefore, you worry about 100% of nothing. And you stay laser focused on the job, the task at hand, which is expanding influence in the market, connecting buyers and sellers from now till the rest of your career until you retire. Why don't you build that business as big as it can go? Why are we even putting two thoughts into what might happen? I don't care about what might happen. I'm talking about what's happening, what's happening right now. And what's happening right now is the largest opportunity that, that I've ever seen in the real estate industry. So many agents have pulled back from expanding influence. There's so much market share on the table if you would just go all in. Not to mention the fact that the larger you get your influence before the year that we hit 7 million existing home sales, which I believe that will happen at some point in the next decade, oh, you're going to be the, the biggest thing that ever happened to the industry if you'll listen to what I'm saying. I've been there, done that. I understand. Now, 
I remember the moment that I realized this, this principle. And I'm going to read it again. Regardless of any headwinds in the market or artificial fear driven by the possibilities of what might happen, people will forever buy and sell houses every single day by the myriads, by the myriads. I remember the moment that I, that I realized this and it was just this huge revelation. It was it was it was such a big light bulb moment uh, for me. And I remember it specifically. I was working on an oil rig in Mississippi and it was after I got off work. I was living in a mobile home like they had mobile homes on site of the oil rig. And it was the funniest thing because it was a mobile home and, 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 and there was two rooms, one on each side. And then there were in the middle room, there was there was two refrigerators and stuff like that. So the night crew that were from six to six lived and slept and ate on one side. And then the, the, the day crew lived and work and slept uh, and ate, on, not work, lived, eat and slept on the other side. And so. <laughs> like talk about reality show, like having all those people living in the same like mobile home and, um, you know, like the night crew eating some of the day crews food and like people getting mad, like there was some wild stuff that went on. But anyway, this is when I was reading so much, reading a hundred books. Like, why did I fail? Like I'm the most hardworking, honest person I know in the world. Like what happened and how am I going to rebuild this empire and never lose it ever again? And one of the books I was reading was named Shift by Gary Keller. And I remember I was standing up over my bunk bed. No one else was in the room. I, I think they all went out partying. Like they used to go out partying. I would sit sit and read in the uh, in the shack. And I remember I remember flipping through the pages, and I was reading. And like um, there's this chart that basically shows the cycles of the market. And I remember seeing it and i remember reading about it and then it just hit me like a ton of bricks and i and i realized wait a minute like closings happen every day no matter what and then i started doing research behind that revelation and i did the research in my mls i went back through i, I, I looked through the past couple years of like me getting out of the business and like there were closings happening every day where there are a lot of closings a lot less than what there were but they were happening every day and i thought okay if they're happening every day i can get a couple a month and it started to become possible i started to realize that it was possible to survive and thrive and really make it not to mention the fact that when a market really crashes agents dive out of the business. They are gone. Um, and it leaves so much market share I'm trying to tell you guys on the table. Um, and, and I went all in. So I got back in the business in 2008 in 2008. That's when I got back in the business. And I realized all the principles I'm teaching you today. And I went all in on my business, expanding influence. Cause at that point I realized expanding influence was the missing piece of the puzzle for me. So I turned right around and went all in with expanding my influence in the market. And that's what, and from there, like my business did this every single year. And I was reading another book uh, here recently and it talked about ants. <laughs> and, and this really hit me hard is, and I try to get this through to people. And I talked about this in my first book, right? The, the chapter is called uh, champions are made in the off season. And I talked about the cycles of the market and how when the market slows down, you go all in prospecting and, and build your database up until the next selling season. And the next selling season, you make more than the last selling season because you're walking into the next selling season with a bigger database. And then the market will slow down again for the next season, you know, a year later. And you go all in again to expand your influence to where you walk into the next selling season. And so you stair step your income this way. This is how I stair stepped my income every single year. And this, this book recently I read that talk, was talking about ants, and it said ants, in the summer, all they're thinking about is winter. And in the winter, all they're thinking about is summer. And that hit me really hard because that's how I've always been. I, that's how I've always been. You know, In certain seasons, I'm thinking about the next season and how to prepare and get ready for so that I can take full advantage of that next season. That's why when the pandemic hit, 
and I realized that, okay, we're down 20% sales and pending deals. We're fixing to see a flood of deals. I put that video out April 28th, 2020. It's still on YouTube. I said, we're about to see the largest real estate surge we've ever seen in history. And that's what happened. We did. We saw the largest real estate surge we've ever seen in history at the end of 20 and through 21. Um, I realized that because, you know, like when, when things are down, I'm like, oh, this is opportunity. And that's exactly how I see it right now. Ever since March 2022, when interest rates started coming up, I knew that we were heading to a different place in the market <coughs> and a place where there was going to be massive opportunity. And the more all in you go right now, the bigger your career is going to be. I'm not talking about 2024. You're going to have a great 2024. You're going to have a great 2025. Awesome. I want to see you making tens and millions, hundreds of millions of dollars <clears throat> over the course of your life. That's what's most interesting to me. How can you get to that quality of life where you can look back and be like, you know what? I can do anything I want to do whenever I want to do it. I'm not tied to anything. All right. But that was the moment that I realized I was on the oil rig. I was reading the shift. And it hit me and I started doing my research and I started realizing, wait a minute, something's going on here. So um, let me let me dive into the next uh, principle here. Contrary to common belief, all right, competition does not exist. I'm sorry. I, ha I hate to tell you guys. I, ha I hate to tell you this one. Competition does not exist. And no agent, no agent can steal any of your clients. Now, of course, I can't steal any of your clients. That's your client. That is your clients. Now, people get this confused. They go on a listing appointment and the seller is interviewing three agents and they don't get the listing and they say, oh, you know, they, you know, they got me. No, no they didn't. That was never your client. You had the possibility to work with that client, but they chose another agent. That's not your client. And, and even, and even your clients. They might choose other agents. I'm going to go through that in just a second. But what you need to realize is that you every, deals take time. From the moment you get the lead, okay, whatever your sales process is, once you get the lead, what happens then? You talk some you or somebody in your team talks to the prospect, figure out what they want to do. You go to the next step, next step, next step, next step. Okay, there's a sales process. Now, sometimes, most of the time when you get a lead, they're not ready right then. Or if you talk to somebody, you know, like, let's just say like everybody in your database aren't ready right now. Let's say you build a database up to 5,000 people, you know, 4,000, you know, 4,950 of them ain't ready to do anything. And the other 50, they're kind of thinking about it. Maybe have, you know, whatever, 10, 20 that are ready to do something right now. Most of the people in your database aren't ready to do anything right now. So, you know, as you're thinking about this, right, and you're building your database, contrary to common belief, competition doesn't exist because the process is so long from creating the relationship to closing the deal, okay? And then once they decide to move forward and actually do the contract, well, then you got to process that entire transaction, which takes time. So I want you to sit there and think about, you can put it in the chat, you think about how many deals could you actually handle right now? Could you handle 100 listings right now? Could you handle 100 pending deals? Could you handle 200 pending deals? You know, you might be thinking 100 deals. There's no way I can even handle 100. Yeah, me neither. I remember at my peak, I had 38. <clears throat> I want to say it was 38 <clears throat> pending deals, pending. And I had 72. I remember I got up to 72 active listings at one time. Had 72 listings, had 38 pending deals, and I was handling it pretty good, but it was a little shaky. I was getting to my breaking point. Now, traditionally, during that whole period where I did 100 deals a year as a single agent, I had 10 to 20 pending deals and 20 to 30 active listings at all times. That was my happy place. I literally could handle that standing on my head. Me and my assistant, Christy, were literally like chilling. Like it, it was, it was nothing to it. Well, why was that? Well, I wasn't prospecting anymore. Number one, a lot of people think the prospecting, the lead gen. No, when you build your business the right way, the way that I teach you, then you don't, you, you get to a point where you're not prospecting anymore. You have so much business coming in from the sources that I teach you to build 
you don't have to prospect anymore. So now you're just servicing. It's just repeats, referrals, referrals of referrals. You don't have to worry about any of that. So at that point, when I was doing 100 deals a year, I was literally just servicing. I was just following up with people that were calling in. I would go show a property here, go to a listing appointment there, go to a closing here. It, it was cake. It was easy. And, and when people call you at that point in your career, when they're, when they're coming, when they're chasing you, you're not chasing them. They're chasing you. Why? Because you built a personal brand. When they're chasing you, they ain't interviewing three agents and they're going to pay you anything you want. So you got to worry about that. If you worried about the NAR law, uh, lawsuit settlement, build, build a personal brand. You don't have a problem getting clients or getting them to pay anything that you want them to pay you. Side note, <clears throat> regardless, the process of the deal and I want you to think about how many deals can you handle, right? You can't handle but so much, X amount. Some people have four pending deals, like four listings and two pending deals, and their week is shot. And I'll never understand it, but I'm empathetic towards it because I know it takes people of all kinds that have different you know, capacities of what they can handle. I get it. Um, but nevertheless, you can only handle so much. And there's closings happening every single day, not to mention every single month. In myriads, myriads. But the thing is, is that because the fact that it's a process, it creates a situation where business is unlimited for everyone. You can't get to every single property owner. Now, think about this. For you to do every deal, which you can't handle, you would have to talk to every single property owner in your market and a buyer and seller, right? Not just sellers, buyers in your market simultaneously every hour, let's say, right? People change their minds every five minutes, right? Let's say they change their mind every hour. All right. You'd have to talk to, have a conversation with, a consultation with every single buyer and seller simultaneously every hour to, to, in order to pick up, to, to, to even, to get, <laughs> to get, to start the deals. Then you got to process them. Never happened. Never happened in a million years. All right. I could go on and on and on here in terms of like when I talk to a prospect, I'm thinking about how many deals that they're going to do over the course of my career. If I want to do business for 20 years, how many deals are they going to do over the course of 20 years? How many times they're going to move? That's two deals every time they move. Plus, how many people are they going to refer out over that 20 year period? That's what I'm thinking about. I'm trying to stack as many deals as I can into a 20 year career here. I'm going to do a couple thousand deals over the course of 20 years. I could go on and on and on with that. But what I want to get into here is your database because I'm saying contrary to common belief, competition doesn't, does not exist and no agent can steal any of your clients. So just to put a little ease to this, um, I wanted to, I wanted to share this with you. Here's your database. All right. Here's your database. The smallest uh, amount of people, right? The smallest group in your database are the clients that are loyal for life. These people are never, ever going to use another agent for as long as they live. They will never refer a different agent other than you for as long as they live. They are ride or die for you. Okay, this is the smallest group in your database, but they do exist. And you know, you know, you know who they are. They're loyal till the end. They will never use another agent. Okay, that's the smallest group. The next biggest group are people that might use you today. They might use another agent tomorrow. This is the next size, okay, group in your database. And this group, you know, they love you. But if another agent brings them a deal, they're going to use that agent. They ain't going to call you. All right. Um, or somebody, an agent could call them out of the blue and say the right things. And bam, they're going to use them. They're, I don't want to say wishy-washy. I don't want to say wishy-washy because that's not really the right word for it. But, but you know where I'm going with it here. And what you have to understand is when clients go and use a different agent, that's okay. Put them in this category, right? That they're in that middle tier of people that might use you today, might use another agent tomorrow. Don't get mad at them. Congratulate them, right? Say, you know, congratulations. You know, tell me about it. Don't don't act hurt over the situation. Don't act like you have resentment and, and, and don't even not act like it. Don't have resentment. Because here's the thing. If you actually cared about them and you were there for their best interest, wouldn't you be happy if they did something that they thought was best for them? I mean, that's why we're there anyway as agents to consult them and to help these people through 
some of the biggest decisions of their life, hoping that what happens is that they end up with what's best for them. So if they choose to go a different route other than use your services, obviously they thought that that's what was best for them. So shouldn't we be happy for them versus being upset with them? The answer is yes. You should be happy for them. You should be congratulating them. Nevertheless, they might use you today. They might use another agent tomorrow, and then they might use you the next day. So you don't want to burn that bridge by acting salty. You know, you don't want you don't want to just cut that, you know, burn that bridge. You know how many people came back to me? I had people go use discount brokers, other agents, ghosted me. I never burnt the bridges. I told them great. And guess what? A lot of them came back to me and used me multiple times after the fact. Um, and if I would have been cold, salty, you know, resentful, they would have never came back to me. And and I wasn't doing it to get the later business either. I was doing it because I cared about them. It wasn't about the money. It's not about the money. It's got to never be about the money. We're, we're gonna do. We're gonna. We're in business. We're gonna do our best to provide the best service, and we're gonna get paid what we're worth. Right? We're gonna get paid what we're worth. We we do a great job, and we charge a fee, and we get paid. But at the end of the day, if somebody doesn't use our services, that's fine with me. Why? Because we've got our loyal for life clients. And, and, and the problem is, is that we haven't built our database up to the size where we have a plentiful amount of loyal for life clients. We're crying because we thought this person was loyal for life and they ended up being in the third, in the, in the middle tier might use me to me today, might use another agent tomorrow, but you know, and now our business, we feel like our business is affected. We feel like we should be, you know, making more money because we built this database and all this stuff. No, you probably quit building the database. That's why I say you've got to expand your influence to the moon. You can't just stop and think, oh, I got a database, so I'm good. No, no, you're not. Why not get as much as you can to help the most people in the market? You know, and remember, like, this is the smallest group. And you want the bigger your database is, the bigger that group's going to be. But it's always going to be the smallest group. That's why you got to build a massive database. And let's look at the third group, which is the largest group. This is the largest group here will never use your services, right? The largest group in your database that are getting your weekly emails and seeing you on social and, and, you know, talk to you on the phone and they're all nice to you and everything will never use your services. Why not? Why won't they ever use your services? I'll tell you why. Because they either don't like you. I hate to tell you this, but not everybody's going to like you. They either don't like you or they have another agent that they feel loyal to, that they like more, or they just feel obligated to, or it's their mom or whatever the case may be. But whatever the case may be, they will never use your services. Now, why do we leave these people in our database? You might be asking, why do we leave? Well, number one, we don't know exactly who these people are, number one. And number two, people can switch different tiers in your database. You could have people in the top tier that will never use your services. And then all of a sudden something happens with the agent they have, or maybe they just grow. Maybe you start to grow on them through your content and they, they move into the might use your you one day and might use the night, or they might even move all the way to loyal client, for, loyal for life. That's why you want your database as big as possible, because you could start to grow on some of these people who are in that never use your services category. And that's what's very interesting. And some of the people that, you know, like there's been people that have been incredibly rude to me who end up like moving tiers into some of these other tiers and using me and, and even becoming loyal for life clients. So anyway, um, that's my three principles for, you know, business development when it comes to real estate agents that will never change regardless of technology, AI, NAR settlement, it doesn't matter. Go all in to do the things that you know you need to do so you can go out there and live the life that you want to live. All right. I hope this video hits home. I hope that you got something out of this. You go execute on some of these principles so that you can have a better life forever. And we'll see you guys on the next video. Take care.